Hello, and welcome to Good Conversations. We're honored to have with us again today, Ken Toole, elected in 2006 to the Public Service Commission for District 5, which includes a big swath of Northwestern Montana. Before being elected to the PSC, Ken represented Helena in the State Senate, where he served six years and was chairman of the Senate Energy and Telecommunications Committee, vice chair of the Senate Taxation Committee, and vice chair of the Natural Resources Committee. Ken is also a founder and program director of the Montana Human Rights Network and a founder and chair of the Policy Institute, a Montana think tank. Full disclosure, I was a fellow with TPI in 2006. Ken was the author of the unsuccessful ballot initiative in 2002 that sought to purchase for public ownership the former Montana power company dam sold under deregulation in the 1990s to Pennsylvania Power and Light. The son of famed Montana historian K. Ross Toole, Ken has served on many boards and councils and has been the recipient of numerous local, regional, and national awards for his work on progressive causes. Ken, thanks again for taking the time to be with Glad us. Glad to do it. Well, at the end of the last program, uh, you were giving our viewers a few tips uh, to maybe look at uh, whatever they can do for energy conservation because right. you're anticipating a big price increase this winter. Yeah, I think the energy prices, every, every indication is that energy prices are going to be high this winter. And now is the time, August, September, you know, through the fall to try and get uh, some things done like hot, hot water heater wraps. Uh, any improvement to windows, storm windows, even getting the plastic up on, on windows in the household, replacing storm doors, those kinds of things make a big difference. Uh, programmable thermostats uh, are, are one of the better things you can do. These are the, the you can set the time on, on, mm -hmm. on it so your uh, power or your heat at least goes on and off. Uh, low flow shower heads are very cheap, easy to install. Wrapping pipes, uh, your hot water pipes, mm -hmm. um, all of those things, thinking about it now, getting those things in can really help with your power bill this winter. Okay. And you also mentioned in the last program that there may be some help available to people who are on fixed income or low income. Right. Yeah. I, I would, in this area, uh, contact Northwest, Northwestern Montana Human Resource Council, uh, Mission Valley Power. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what programs they have available, but they would certainly know uh, what's out there. Um, Energy Share is a private nonprofit organization that has bill assistance. Um, that can help people. So uh, I would start with Mission Valley Power and Northwest Montana Human Resources, and then they ought to be able to refer you somewhere else. Okay. Well, thanks for that. And let's switch gears a little bit now. I mean, it's all related, but mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about renewables and clean energy. Um, you have mm -hmm. a strong interest in that. Uh, tell us about it. Well, I, you know, I've been active with environmental organizations since the early 1980s, uh, Montana Environmental Information Center, Northern Plains Resource Council, and during that time working on energy issues. And in fact, when I started uh, with Northern Plains Resource Council, it was at the time period after the Arab oil embargo. Uh, we saw prices spiking, uh, lots of talk about building new plants, and in fact, we ended up building Coal Strip Unit 3 and 4 uh, during that time. And uh, throughout all of the time that I've been working on energy issues, I've been a strong advocate of renewable uh, power sources, solar, wind, geothermal, uh, other alternatives to the traditional fossil fuel um, uh, base of our energy system. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is the environmental impacts of burning fossil fuels. I mean, you can burn some more cleanly than others, and, and you can do some things to reduce uh, the impacts on air and water. But ultimately, at the end of the day, when you're burning something, you're going to be emitting uh, uh, pollution. Mm -hmm. And so that that's a part of it. But the bigger part of it is all fossil fuel sources are finite. Uh, and all fossil fuel generation of electricity requires a fuel. And so if you think about it, if you build, uh, let's say, a coal plant, that coal plant is going to be in your power system 30, 40, 50, 60 years. At the beginning, you know that it costs you so much to build it, and you know that it, how much coal it's going to use over time but you don't know what the price is going to be at the end mm -hmm. of that time period. There is no way that we can accurately predict natural gas prices over a 50-year time horizon, coal prices over a 50-year time horizon. And so those big plants have an inherent risk 
and that risk is related to the cost of the fuel. Mm -hmm. So, and this is separate from the sure. environmental impact. Sure. Um, the huge advantage for wind, uh, solar, geothermal is they don't have that fuel cost risk over a long period of time. And once you put them in your system, you know what they cost to build, mm -hmm. and and they cost more up front. So if you look at what what economists call the life cycle costs on a natural gas plant, it starts here with the investment in the plant, and then over time it keeps going up as you put more and more fuel into it. A renewable energy project is the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. All of your costs are at the beginning, and then over time, um, the cost actually it stays level because you don't have fuel costs coming in. Right. There's um, some maintenance costs, basically. Yeah, you've got some maintenance costs, but that's that's really insignificant. Um, the big cost in a renewable energy plant is upfront capital investment. Mm -hmm. I believe, and, and now I believe it even more firmly that I'm on the Public Service Commission and spend hours in a day going through all the economic analysis of this, that our current system doesn't value a resource that doesn't have fuel risk. I mean, they have formulas and they try and do it, but the bottom line is you cannot predict natural gas prices out. Hell, you can't do it five years, right. let alone 20 years. And the problem is whether you're high or low, if you miss the amount, there, there are bad impacts for ratepayers, consumers, either way, high or low. Hmm. Um, and so I've always felt that renewables are not given the the uh, real value of not having a fuel risk. Right. So that's been, and that's separate from the environmental impacts. That's so odd that they're not. And I mean, it's been one of Al Gore's points, and he recently released this right. ambitious uh, challenge to the country to switch to completely carbon-free energy system right. in 10 years, right. mostly out of his concern for global warming. But he's right. making the argument that you are that there's these upfront costs, right. but then the stuff that powers these right. things is free. Right. It's sunshine and wind. Right, yeah. and that, that's, I mean, the, the, the idea that we can move uh, completely off of fossil fuels um, is now out there, thanks to Al Gore and a number of others, the Policy Institute, which you mentioned, we just brought a guy named David Freeman up to speak in Montana. Dave Freeman was the head of Tennessee Valley Authority. He was the head of LA Water Power, uh, head of the Sacramento Utility District. I mean, the guy is a, a big time utility executive, and he's got a new book out where he makes exactly this argument that uh, we have to get off fossil fuels and we can, mm. and it's doable. Mm -hmm. We have to dedicate ourselves to doing it. The benefits of getting off fossil fuels, I mean, we all tend to focus on either the, the environment or, um, or the, the cost spikes that we're seeing now, but the long-term benefits, I mean, think about not being entangled in the Middle East. Yeah. I mean, we've been entangled in the Middle East since the 1950s, mm -hmm. uh, and, and which, you know, is is anything but risky, right? I mean, right. it's a very uh, bad place in the world to be involved. Very in. expensive, I, exactly. and we'd have thousands right. of fine young people still alive That's today. Right. If That's we, right. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, as Brian Schweitzer always said, all it takes is one tanker going down in the Straits of Hormuz, and we've got ten dollar a gallon gas. Hmm. Uh, it's a very precarious position to be in, and so there are just all kinds of arguments, I think, mm -hmm. for moving on to uh, the next economy. Well, let, let me just interject something here, which is that the, the first thing I think about is reducing how much energy we use. Right. Uh, conservation, is, isn't right. that the most effective, cheapest way right. to, re, uh, the, to deal with this the stuff? Cheapest, the cheapest energy we have is the energy we don't use. Yeah. Um, and the, the principle here is if, if you have to go out and buy a power plant right now, you pay a lot. I mean, they're expensive, whether it's gas, whether it's oil, whether it's nuclear, those things cost a lot. Every, every instant you can defer the need to buy something new is cheaper than what's out there to build. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the argument for conservation. Okay. Um, and there's a tremendous amount that we can do uh, to have more efficient use of the energy we have, from weather, weatherizing the old homes we have, um, to making sure that new homes that are built are built in an energy efficient way, making sure that new appliances, uh, the, the Energy Star program, um, are designed and built with efficiency in mind. People go into subcompact fluorescent bulbs instead of incandescent bulbs. 
Um, there are a lot of things we can do to use energy more efficiently that really have no impact on our lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, you know, everybody thinks it means put on a sweater and shiver and freeze in the dark. Um, mm -hmm. No, it doesn't. Uh, simple things like orienting houses to the south so they take advantage of the sun. Um, lots of things we could be doing. Energy efficient building codes adds a little bit to the cost of the house, but clearly it's recovered over the, the those initial costs are recovered over the life of the house many times over. Right, right. And what, what about some of the, I mean, they, they may be less, but there still are some environmental impacts from some of these S renewable sources of oh, energy yeah. like solar yeah. and wind. Yeah. There was just a story in Montana here right. a couple of days ago about something like 1,200 bats and birds sure. found dead around the Judith Gap wind right. farm. Right. Uh, what about that kind of issue? Well, th those things, there are impacts. Yeah. I mean, there just is no question about it. Um, I think that the way that you deal with those are the same way we've dealt with them with fossil fuel based uh, facilities. You do what you can to control those things. Uh, back in the early days of wind, and I don't know if you remember this, but the first demonstration projects in Montana were put down by Livingston right along the Yellowstone River. Well, guess what? A lot of birds got killed because it was in a flyway. Yeah. I, oh, well, we figured, well, if we move it out of the flyway, you know, then we don't have right. the same kind of bird kill. Um, and the, the towers were, in those days, were not as tall. The blades weren't as right. big. They, they right. spun more like a, a right. room fan than... Right. Right. You couldn't even well, see the blades moving. Yeah. yeah, although people should know when you see those big machines and it looks right. like the wheels are going slow, yeah. the speed at the end of the rotor is still very fast. Huh. Um, huh. But I think you just deal with those problems as you can. The fact of the matter is we are going to have, there are going to be environmental impacts. With a wind farm, you've got roading that goes in, you've got mm -hmm. the uh, habitat fragmentation issues, um, you've got transmission, how do you get it out? Um, I don't think any power source is going to be without impact, but there are certainly some more than others. And to me, the challenge is figuring out what those impacts are, what you can do to mitigate the impacts, uh, what you can't mitigate, and what, who's going to bear those costs. Now, generally speaking, aren't the bigger impacts from the more centralized power generation facilities, whether it's a big wind farm as opposed to one wind turbine on a farm, or it's a, a giant array of solar panels right. occupying desert tortoise habitat in the right. desert right. as opposed to somebody's got solar panels on their own roof. Right. Yeah, and I, I think that just depends. I mean, definitely, and what you're talking about with the small systems is what uh, in the energy world they call distributed systems. Mm -hmm. That means a utility system that has a small wind turbine on someone's house or solar panels yeah. uh, around the system rather than a large central station. Mm -hmm. I think as a general rule, you would expect you're gonna have s less impact from the small distributed system. But mm -hmm. if everybody is on the system, for example, if everybody in town had a windmill, right. um, there, that might be significant. It's all sure. about uh, thinking that stuff through. But right. um, large industrial scale development tends to localize impacts and make them, I think, larger. Right. Now, what about that decentralized stuff? Um, you know, uh, is that something that, that Montana's current electrical grid system could, could deal with? I mean, presumably, you know, these, these single mm -hmm. units would have some surplus that they'd want right. to feed back into the grid. Well, I, th I think in the end, that's where we ought to go. And I think in the end, it's going to be about solar and being able to store uh, and win at some levels. But um, that's some distance out there. And yes, right now with Northwestern Energy, you can do what's called net metering, where you put up a windmill and it essentially runs your meter backwards when you're not mm -hmm. using the power and you, and you net out your power bill. I think they have some 350 or so accounts that are net metered. So mm -hmm. on the Northwestern system, uh, that's moving along. On the co-ops in Montana, it's not as I well. See. Because I think co-ops don't promote it in the same way that Northwestern Energy does. I see. And they do it a little differently. The rules are different that make it not as attractive. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, I think that's the kind of system, and this is where you hear about the you know, uh, 10 million solar rooftops initiative or whatever it is in California that that's the kind of system that's going to work best for all of us. If, if houses coming onto the system 
contain their own generation sources yeah. um, to produce their own power, and that's happening in California. They yeah. have they have zero energy use housing coming on. Hmm. So, huh. um, because part of what's happening is as fossil fuel prices are going up, renewable c costs are coming down because now wind farms used to be, wind used to be too expensive. Hmm. It's not anymore. It's competitive on its own, without subsidy, without anything, it's competitive against hmm. uh, fossil fuel. Solar still is not, but technology is improving, and I think those curves are gonna cross, and when that starts to happen, I think that's when we start to see a proliferation and we get a lot more small distributed energy systems. Hmm. Interesting, well, we're right at our halfway point. We're gonna take a one minute break and we'll continue our conversation with Ken Toole, Public Service Commissioner for District 5. Please don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Good Conversations. We're continuing our conversation with Ken Toole, Public Service Commissioner for District 5 here in Northwest Montana. And Ken, before the break, uh, we were talking a bit about uh, renewable energy uh, mm -hmm. and how it can compete with fossil fuels. And you're saying that wind already does mm -hmm. and solar is getting there. And mm -hmm. as those prices, as solar prices drop and Fossil fuels right. rise when that those lines right. cross, then we'll really see a revolutionary change. Right. Um, but are there more things that government can be doing either here in Montana or nationally to kind of speed that up? Well, sure. I mean, the the whole energy picture. I think we really need a massive mobilization uh, along the lines of getting a man on the moon or the New Deal, World War II. I mean, this is a very serious uh, problem that we've got. Price is part of it, but climate change, uh, yeah. that's something we just gotta deal with. Uh, and so, if we have that kind of mobilization, I think the first thing that government needs to be doing is thinking about uh, tax incentives, kind of the traditional way of trying to motivate economic behavior with tax incentives, tax credits, uh, but I, I also think it's important to, when looking at fossil fuels, make fossil fuels pay what they really cost. And what this has to do with is the emission of carbon. Um, and don't let, what's happened traditionally is uh, the oil industry, uh, coal industry has successfully pushed some of their costs onto society, the cost of pollution that society then pays. We pay it in medical bills, we pay it all kinds of ways. It's similar to if your neighbor started a concentrated feedlot organization going and they knew they had to do something with the waste and they decided what they're gonna do is just dump it on your ground and not pay you anything for it. Well, I'm a little surprised because you're almost making a libertarian environmental argument. I mean, th their argument all along has right. been that the the cure for environmental problems is to internalize right. these environmental costs that has so far been externalized from these right. products. But the flaw with the libertarian angle on it is they don't want government to cause them to internalize it. And I don't know how else you do it. Uh -huh. I mean, it, it needs to be part of the tax code, part of the incentive program that we're looking at. Uh, but I bring up the incentives, the tax code, and all of that stuff because I do think because of climate change, and because of uh, world security issues and fossil f fuel supplies, this needs to be a national priority. Getting us off of uh, fossil fuels 
uh, needs to be something that we as a nation take on uh, as a high priority. And I think that's happening. I mean, you're already seeing lots of things happening. I mean, l even look on the highway now. People right. are, you, you see a lot more Priuses, Honda hybrids, right. smaller cars. Um, and right. along the side of the highway, I don't know if folks have noticed this, you see big pickup trucks with for sale signs. <laughs> yeah. So, good time to buy a big pickup truck. <laughs> yeah, well, and a bad time, too. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, no question. I mean, the, to me, this is going to be the preeminent right. challenge for the rest of our lifetimes, is right. whether we can deal with climate change. It really threatens the world as we know it. And we had Steve running mm -hmm. on this program uh, a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And I also read just recently James Hansen, perhaps the nation's mm -hmm. leading authority on climate change, saying that the scientific certainty on this is now exceeding 99%. Right. And that really the tipping point is 350 parts per million of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. We're now at 385. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't start rolling that backwards, we're really in trouble. Right. Well, the irony, I think, on the climate change debate is that the debate is among politicians. And when you look at the, the scientific community and, and how they've done the analysis and the evidence that's out there, there isn't a lot of debate among scientists. There's some. I mean, there's always some dissenting Thomas somewhere. But if you walk into the legislative halls in Montana, you would think that climate change is a myth. Mm -hmm. um, and you get these guys saying, and we have a commissioner on the commission that's the same way. Well, it, global warming is all about sunspots. And, you know, I, I know where that's coming from. It's coming out of national right-wing think tanks that are funded and paid for by fossil fuel industry, and they don't want to see uh, an aggressive program to get rid of, uh, to try and address climate change. So, uh, but it is ironic because I think, uh, by and large, the controversy in the political arena makes your average citizen unsure what to think. Yeah. Um, and it's unfortunate because the scientists, the people that we hopefully trust at some level uh, to go out there, be objective, really analyze problems, seem to be uh, remarkably unified. Uh, remarkably. This I is a problem. Thousands of scientists right. internationally, and I think there hasn't been a single published report right. in recent years that's contested that climate change is occurring. And, well, I think there's uh, something by a chiropractor in Texas. That's not a published, <laughs> I don't think peer reviewed. Right, yeah, right. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's enormous and in some ways overwhelming. And we mentioned uh, in the first half of the program Al Gore's uh, recent proposal to completely right. adopt an, a carbon free energy economy in right. 10 years. Right. Do you support that as a public service commissioner? I mean, would you like to see Montana Absolutely. pursue that? I, I think we have to move that way. Whether we can do it in 10 years, I'm not sure. Um, I think we can, If within the utility industry, uh, when I go to national meetings, I, you know, it's very dominated by uh, fossil fuel interests, and so they say it's not doable. I, I think it is definitely doable. Uh, but the key to me, I'm not sure if it's doable in 10 years, but the key to me is that we not build a bunch of new coal plants. Mm -hmm. We not build any more fossil fuel-based things other than natural gas. I think we're going to have to use natural gas, and I believe this is part of Al Gore's uh, proposal. Right. Is and T. Boone Pickens. Right. <laughs> natural gas is going to be a bridge right. uh, to yeah. get us because the problem, as you know, with wind and solar is it doesn't work when the wind doesn't blow and the sun isn't shining and we don't have good storage technology. I mean, hopefully we'll get to the point you can fill your batteries when the wind's blowing mm -hmm. um, and then draw it out when it's not. We don't have that technology yet and that's why we need natural gas. Mm -hmm. Natural gas enables us to fill in Mm -hmm. uh, those time periods when the wind isn't blowing, the sun isn't shining, and uh, we're going to have, I don't see how we can do it without gas. Yeah, yeah. Well, what, what a challenge. And do, do you see uh, support from leading political figures in Montana for aggressive action on this issue? Um, yeah, I do. I mean, okay. uh, Brian Schweitzer just came out with uh, a million dollars, declared an energy emergency, a million dollars for low-income weatherization. That was a few days ago. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there is broad recognition. I think the problem we have in Montana is our economy, traditional resource-based economy, is dependent on coal. Mm -hmm. And I think our political figures are a little conflicted and don't want to sound like they're anti-coal. Right. But uh, the Schweitzer administration, and as far as I know, Bacchus, 
Reberg, Tester, all very supportive of the wind development going on in Montana. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think generally they are. Um, yeah. I, I think we have a long way to go. I think we're in the middle of a culture change yeah. about energy. And that I think five years from now, we'll look at these efforts and think they were a drop in the bucket. Um, mm -hmm. But that shift's well, happening. I mean, we only have a few minutes left, but I, I just want to ask about what about China? I mean, they've been putting one new coal plant a week online for several years. And I mean, what, what about hard, China? Well, how, how do I we mean, get them to come? Well, because the first it's a thing global do, problem, right? The first thing we do is work on our own house and work on reducing our carbon emissions because we have no credibility. If we go to India and China right now and say, you guys can't burn coal, oh, but we're gonna continue to do it. Um, so I think the first thing is lead by example. The second thing is develop the technology. I mean, that's what Americans can do. Make sure these new technologies are getting out there, getting into the market and are available to the developing countries, India, China, et cetera. That, uh, the, the thing, what about China, and this is what everybody says, what we can't afford to do is sit uh, with our arms folded on our chest and say we're not going to do anything because China mm -hmm. is, is continuing down the path they're continuing on. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing I'd add about China is their political system enables them to uh, make changes in a much faster way than we do. Mm -hmm. And that if we can get China committing to more efficient housing stock, other forms of energy and help facilitate that. I think that they, well, they've proven they can do it with uh, their hydroelectric projects that they're putting, and you could never do that in our political system, thankfully. Yeah. Um, but you know, they're they're damming up the Yangtze right and left, yeah. and other rivers. Um, right. So I, you know, I think we can't wait for China to come along. And what we need to do is lead by example, pressure China where we can pressure them, pressure India where we can pressure them, like the rest of the world's doing. Sure. Um, are there other technology issues that you'd like to mention in just the couple minutes we have left here? Well, the, I, just generally to say that um, the, the economic equation is changing in such a way that we're, we are going to see rapid technological advancement. We're seeing with hybrids, we're going to see plug-in hybrids, we're going to see the electric car, the Volt, you know, the Chevy Volt. Mm -hmm. That's coming. We haven't even touched on the transportation sector here. Um, and that's a part of the energy picture where we can have uh, plug-in hybrids that you plug in at night at home, off-peak, you drive to work, you plug in there, you pay for that, and then you're using the power that you have in your hybrid to power your home. I mean, yeah. there there is stuff coming. The one thing I can tell you about technology is it's going to be things we never expected 10 years from now. Hmm. Well, that's a great way to wrap up, and I'm sorry that we're out of time because we only have about another hour <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> worth of things topics to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but we hope to have you back here soon if, you, if right. you'd be willing to well, do it. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. And thanks for being with us. Uh, this has been Good Conversations with Ken Tool, Public Service Commissioner for District 5. Uh, so long, and we'll see you next week.